Right, I've got one. Oh, excellent, that's sounds quicker than usual. We are running slightly behind, I do apologise for that. I should just try to get the story in. Um, value for money, look at it that way. So, we'll now leave Enigma behind. Everything you're going to hear about now has nothing to do with Enigma. There are many different ciphers worked on at Bletchley Park. And we're now in the National Museum of Computing, which then was H-Block, otherwise home to the testery set up by Rolf Tester. Rolf Tester was researching this kind of signal, which has started to be picked up from coming out of Berlin. Now, it's obviously not Morse code. It's much faster. It's a teleprinter signal, and they called it non-Morse. Now, they set up a dedicated listening station called Knockout to hear that signal and to record what it was saying. I'll explain how they did in a second. But this is a rebuild of Knockout. It's all original equipment. And what you're listening to is not a recording. We have a shortwave antenna on the roof, and we are picking this up from a weather station in Germany live. And it's been pumped out on an original radio. They're all still working. We're quite annoying on the ears, so I'll turn it down if that's all right. There we go. Now, unlike Enigma, they didn't have the same help that they had with the poles. Um, no one knew what the signal was. No spies had any information. We were completely in the dark. No intelligence existed. And that's how it pretty much carried on. They were researching it here. The only thing they knew is that it was using the international teleprinter standard. Now, how they actually read the message initially was using a device down there called Nundulator. Now, I've only got these three little uh, quite tacky handouts, I'm afraid. Um, so if you could share those around so everyone can... Uh, um, however, when, uh, when they did read it, it was obviously ciphertext. It made no sense at all. It was a stream of characters. So they didn't know what to do. And they were left in the dark for a long time. Until 1941. And, uh, sort of uh, late, I think it was late autumn of 19, uh, 1941. A new branch of this network, which is obviously a very important network, because it didn't move around like Enigma did. It also had these spokes coming out of Berlin, fixed points of communication. But a new one's being set up between Athens and Vienna. And the engineers are talking using the system, but they're not encrypting the messages. So we're listening in at Knockout. And they're talking about signal strength and frequencies and technical stuff. Not very interesting. But then one of them says, let's try out the secret writer. <laughs> so we started listening a little more intently at that point. He then sent, the guy in Athens sent to Vienna and said, here are your settings. So, no rotors this time, no plug board or anything like that, 12 letters. There are your settings. You realize it's fine, commence transmission. The guy in Athens then sent a 4,000 or so character message. One letter at a time, did it manually, with all of you have done the tape in advance and fed it through the machine as fast as possible. So it must have taken a long time to send. Knockout got a clear transmission of it, but the guy in Vienna radioed back to Sorry, old chap, didn't get that. Could you send it again? <laughs> now, the other guy must have been a bit annoyed because he then made two howling mistakes. Mistake number one, he said, OK, use the same settings again. Now, the reason that was a huge mistake is what happened next. He then resent the message. Now, if he'd sent it exactly the same, it would have been on the wiser. However, he made it about 100 characters shorter, abbreviating as he went along. So, right from the start, Spruckner, Serial number was short to struck NR, like we shortened number to NO. All in all, about 100 characters um, shorter, but for all intents and purposes, for the first time, Bletchley Park had the settings and two messages sent using those settings. Because unlike Enigma, they were changing the settings for these messages on every single message, not every 24 hours, but every message. Volumes of around 300 messages a day. And it's called a Vernum cipher. Now, We've talked about the plain text and cipher text. I'm going to add a third element in now called the key stream. What this machine did was generate a seemingly random stream of characters exactly the same length as the plain text message you wants to send. But the way to explain it is to think about not letters but patterns. What it would do, it would generate this series of patterns and you would have the patterns of your message. And in using a mathematical technique called modulo 2, it would kind of overlay the two patterns, to create a new set of patterns. That's your ciphertext, and that's what's transmitted. 
At the other end, an identically set up machine generates the same key stream, but then mathematically removes it to reveal the original message hidden away. Now we knew how that worked, they needed to work out how this device generated the key stream. How would you predict which letter it was going to produce next? This was seemingly impossible to do. But Bill Tutt, a young uh, chemistry graduate who was based here at H-Block, became obsessed with the problem and worked on it for about three months. Often working in solitude, rarely sleeping. At the end of the three months, he came to the other nine members of the testery and presented them with this diagram. Some historians have referred to this as the single greatest intellectual feat by a, an individual human being of World War II. Because this was 100% right. This mysterious new machine the Germans were using, this describes perfectly, 100% accurate. It is a 12 rotor device, two rows of five, and two motor wheels that controlled it. And he worked out the behaviour of these, all these wheels and exactly how they worked. He was 24 when he did that. Now they had this diagram, they could build their own one. This is it. The networks were all named after fish, and this particular branch of network would be nicknamed Tony. So they also called this device Tony. And what this does is exactly the same job as this mysterious German machine. Now, the machine in question was never seen until the end of World War II, when one was finally captured. And that was the first time anyone in Goodman Code Cycle School got to see one. And that's what it looked like. This is a Lorenz SZ42, a much bigger machine than Enigma, and it was also known by then that this was being used by Hitler himself and his high command for communication at the highest level. The information in here was gold. Apparently, Bill Tuck was a little disappointed when he saw it was so small compared to what he came up with. <laughs> this was built by the General Post Office's Research Centre at Dollars Hill. So, if it looks a bit like an old telephone exchange, that's because it's, a bit, it's an old telephone exchange. Because that's what they had in the parts bin, so that's what they used to build it. It does exactly the same job. You type, once you set it up, these represent the rotors. You type in your ciphertext on that keyboard there, and on the teleprinter, the plain text will come out. Now, this is not an original. It, is, it was built by the National Museum of Computing over the past three years. Just like the bombs I showed you in HUT 11 are not originals either. However, if you go down to Block B, you can see a real live one working this afternoon. Uh, as a result of this, I'm not allowed to touch it. <laughs> now we have a machine that could read these signals. You have one remaining problem, which is how do you get the settings? Because it wasn't the whole procedure to broadcast the settings in advance. And they were changing the settings on every single message. Luckily, Tillman and Tutt had worked out there were significant flaws in the way the Lorenz machine worked. And they could break any Lorenz, machine, any Lorenz encrypted message if you gave them six to eight weeks per message. And that was the problem. They worked out a seven stage process to break the message, but the first two parts of the process took about six to eight weeks, and the remaining five took a couple of hours. Fortunately, it was believed they could use machines to speed up those two processes. And the engineers here went to work trying to design machines to speed up the... It was kind of a statistical analysis process they had to go through. The first attempt to do this was this machine here. This is another rebuild of this machine. It's called the Heath Robinson. And those of you who have ever seen the Heath Robinson cartoons will get that joke. The message is mounted on this device called the bedstead. Runs around at very high speed past an optical character reader. And on it, these relays make count, and they're looking for patterns, hidden patterns in the message that wouldn't be obvious to the human eye. Now, this is an authentic rebuild, so just like the original Heath Robinson, it doesn't work at all. It breaks down all the time, it keeps snapping the tape, and the relays burn out. So it wasn't a very well designed machine, but it did show the way forward. A young engineer called Tommy Flowers was brought onto the project, and he had two great ideas. He said, We've got to scale the machine up, it's too small, and we've got to replace these relays with something that can switch much faster valves. He designed a new machine, and what he probably didn't realise at the time, thank you, is that he just designed the world's first programmable computer. Colossus. Would you like to see it? No. <laughs> I'm going to say, someone's going to say that one day. Nah, I think you're alright. <laughs> Follow me.
So how come we got one here? Well again, back to Tony Sale. Um, working only from nine photographs and two circuit diagrams, which is all there was left of the proof of the existence of Colossus, he reverse engineered the machine, firstly as a computer model, and then later on designing it in uh, computer aid design packages, and then started the actual construction. Now at that time, PT were throwing out all of the analog exchanges to replace them with digital ones, so the very parts uh, Colossus was made from, there was suddenly an influx of supply. So that was handy. The machine was built up and finally switched on in 2007. Now at that point, um, Tony was desperate to prove that these machines really were. This wasn't just a smoke and mirror show. So they sent a Lorenz machine over to Germany and encrypted the message on it and sent it over non more shortwave, as we heard earlier, for anyone to have a go at the crypto. It was successfully picked up in the room next to us on that very equipment at about 3 o'clock that afternoon and our modern code breakers went to work. Just over three hours later, after Colossus had run, we had the settings for the Lorenz machine. Dialed into our machine here and successfully produced the playtext. Brilliant results. However, this competition was open to anyone and a rather enterprising young student wrote some code breaking software in his own, ran it on his very high power laptop and cracked the message in 46 seconds. <laughs> and just to show you how far we've come, I've got here a little device some of the younger people might know here, a Raspberry Pi. This is a new £20 computer uh, designed in Britain using British technology, um, hopefully going to become very uh, prominent in schools because it only costs £20. But it's got enough horsepower that it runs the same software that that uh, German students created in about four minutes. So just over three hours to four minutes on the £20 device. That's how far we've come. Um, however, if whatever phone you've got, computer you've got, television set, even your clock radio, they are all general purpose computers, and this right here was the first one. This is Grandad. The photoelectric cell, which is not bad for 1943 technology. And every time you hear the relays click over, you might just be able to see them move, that has completed one circuit. The reason it's doing that is that this has no memory whatsoever. It's not capable of memory. So this is acting in its memory. Every time it wants to do a new calculation, it reads the uh, message in fresh. But unlike Heath Robinson, it no longer breaks the tape. And it is actually working on real piece of analysis first. When the run is finished, it will spit out a load of numbers on this teleprinter. And one number will be significantly larger than the others. And that gives you those first five rotor settings. But in terms of putting this into context for you, just to finish off, the build up to D Day was when Colossus really came into his own. Around that time, many operations were going underway, uh, such as Operation Fortitude, which was designed to convince the Germans that we were going to go into Calais, not Normandy. And two problems. One, were we being too subtle, dropping our little secrets and hints about where we were going in through our double agents and spies? Or two, were they seeing right through it and laughing at us? had to be sure before we sent all those brave soldiers in that we made it as safe as possible for them. There were messages going back and forward from Hitler with Hitler himself directing the generals to move away from Normandy and reinforce Calais. And they were read on these machines. And the go-ahead for D-Day was given a H block. And if that doesn't send a shiver down your spine, I don't know what will. So at that point, I'd like to bring the tour to an end. You've been very patient. I know we've got delayed at the post office a little bit. Um, but I hope you've had good value for money as a result. So obviously, it's Veterans Day. There is too much going on to possibly tell you about all of it. But please look at your programs and uh, see what's going on. Uh, don't forget, we have a lovely gift shop. Um, well worth the look. We've actually seriously got a very nice bookshop at the end of that. Do you like any recommendations? Glowing, look. 